Well, y'all, it's preaching time, and um, I've been in my phone in church today. I've been in my phone. I've been tagging people who have been so kind and so generous to help us fund this dream. Uh, and I got more people to tag, but it's preaching time. But, but you'll see in the comments, I began tagging people because today's sermon is all about funding the dream. And today's sermon is going to be both a future cast of where we're going, and it's going to be a moment to offer gratitude for those who've gotten us to where we are. Amen. So I want you to do me a favor. It's real important. I've said it like five times today, but please share this stream. Please share this stream. Please share this stream. Please share this stream because Double Love is not just uh, the members that, that have signed a giving a, a join form and said that they are members but double love is literally a like a tribe like it's become just this movement right a jesus movement for black lives and so please help me share this largely because there's so many folks who support us in different ways i want them to know where we're going and how grateful we are for their support along the way amen uh so tag some folks that you think need to hear this word uh Say thank you to some folks that you know have been a support. Um, and we're going further, okay? We're going further. But y'all help me. Y'all help me spread the word. That vision is going forth. And we need everybody to go with us, all right? Amen. Amen. Turn with me in your Bibles. It's a long passage of scripture, but it's necessary. Somebody say necessary. All right. Uh, I already prepped the team. I said my sermon, it might be a little long today. We're going to get out on time, but it might be a little long today. But, but it's necessary. Somebody say necessary. All right, so we're in Acts chapter 4, verses 32 through 37. Then we're going to kick over to Acts chapter 5, verses 1 through 10. Amen. And it reads, All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's grace was so powerfully at work in them that there were no needy persons among them. For time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to anyone who had need. Verse 36, Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Chapter 5, verse 1, now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit? and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land. Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied just to human beings, but to God. Verse five, when Ananias heard this, he fell down and died and great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Then some young men came forward, wrapped up his body and carried him out and buried him. Verse seven, about three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, that's the price. Verse nine, Peter said to her, how could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out also. Verse 10, at the moment she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came in, finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Sermon topic for today is fund the dream. Pray with me. Lord, we are your vessels. Help us to remember that every good and perfect gift comes from above, that we are not owners of the gift, but merely stewards. Teach us how to steward your gifts well for the upbuilding of your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 
Beloved, I'm here to preach a sermon that I got to be honest with y'all. I was, I was a little bit hesitant to preach because, you know, it, it, I feel like in the black church, we have a really interesting relationship to money, right? Uh, you're either in the camp where you give everything. You just, I mean, like you just give all your coins and you just put some faith on it and hope you make it. Um, or you're in the camp where you don't trust the preacher, you don't touch the deacons, you don't trust the church, you are convinced that the money is going to be mishandled, and you just don't rock with it. And there are very few ways that people know how to show up in the in-between, right? Um, and so for that reason, uh, I've, been, I've been a little hesitant. I've been a little, I'm going to be honest with y'all, I've been a little hesitant uh, to do a, a, a sermon, uh, let alone a dream, um, that focuses on our desire for everybody to be a tithing member, right? Not because I don't believe in tithing. I believe in tithing, and tithing has blessed my life from the time I was a little kid. My mother taught me to tithe when I was very young. Y'all met my mama, like, I, sh I came out the womb tithing. If, if, if she gave me a dollar, I was given 10 cents in offering that Sunday. So I believe in tithing, right? Let's just, let's just be clear on that. Um, but I've seen what has happened in the black church universal where so many individuals have been taken advantage of um, because of their heart to give to the Lord and because of the humanity of people. So many people's humanity has clouded the divinity of the moment when we give. We're not supposed to be giving to people or institutions, but we're giving to God. And it is the people and the institutions that have uh, 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 aligned with God to do good over what is being given, right? That, that's, that's what's supposed to happen. But there's been uh, so much harm done um, that I, quite frankly, don't, I don't like talking or preaching about money because I know that it comes with baggage, right? I, I know our viewer numbers a little bit lower today than they were last week because we told y'all ahead of time we talked about money. That's all right. I understand because it can be a little, can be a little uh, uncomfortable at times. But here's the thing. We got to talk about it. Somebody say it's necessary. it's necessary. We have to talk about it because good stewardship is required of believers. And stewardship is not only connected to our giving, but it is absolutely connected and encompassing our giving, right? So, 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 I mean, you can be a good steward over your gift. If you are gifted in a particular area, maybe you are a vocalist, maybe you are, I don't know what you do, but you can be gifted in that area and you can be a good steward over it and you can volunteer at your church. And you can do, that's being a good steward. That's wonderful, right? There are many ways that we can be good stewards over what God has given us, but we cannot ignore the requirement to be a good steward over our finances. We can't. We cannot. And we cannot hide behind the fact that humans who have made human decisions, um, we cannot hide behind the fact that because of the mistakes of human beings that we're not going to do what God has required of us to do. Let, let me help you right here. Your job is to do your due diligence to make sure that you can trust the place you're giving to and then after you release it, you are no longer accountable for what that money does. The leadership is accountable. Let me release you from feeling as though you got to police everything. You know, what you got to do is be in right alignment with the Lord. Pray about where God is sending your resources. And after you give, you have completed your act of stewardship. And if the institution or the individual does wrong with what you gave, the institution and the individual will be judged harshly, not you. That's why the Bible says that everyone ought not aspire to be a teacher and preacher of the gospel because we will be judged more harshly. Everybody thinks it's glamorous to be the person on the flyer, or the person in the pulpit, but we are the ones for whom God says of us, what did you do with their money? 
What did you do with their commitment? What did you do with their faith? What did you do with their trust? We are the ones who are held more highly accountable because you gave based on the principle of stewardship. And our principle of stewardship means that we are to steward everything you give as though you are giving it directly to God and not to us because that is, in fact, what's happening. Okay? Okay. So when you see scandals and when you see fraudulent acts and when you see things on TMZ and the Shade Room and and Page Six and all of that of these pastors and churches mishandling funds, guess what? You're not at fault, beloved, because you gave based on the principle of tithing and stewardship. It's the leadership and the institution that have to answer to God, okay? I want to start there. I start there because it's very important to make sure that we are honoring God with everything God asks of us, right? And giving is one of those things. I want to walk you through really briefly some of the ways that God has funded this dream already. Is that all right? I I want to testify, right? I want it's necessary. I want to testify real quick, and then we're going to get into uh, some of the things that, that God is showing us we can grow to uh, in the next year and a half. But, but I want to testify, uh, y'all know we just celebrated two years in November, uh, but really we have been double love since October 2018. Can I, can I testify real quick? Can I testify? Okay. Uh, October 2018, uh, that is when we began our preview year, uh, and we uh, began that year. And I want to let you know, uh, contrary to anybody, what what anybody else may say, we started Double Love completely independently without a penny from any organization or institution. Okay? That's no shade to churches that have started with seed money. I'm just trying to let you know that wasn't our testimony. Okay? We started with uh, nothing. And here's what's so powerful about, you know, this, this, this principle of funding the dream, right? We had a dream, and, um, you know, we had some folks that came alongside us as a launch team, uh, three individuals in the beginning who came alongside us as a launch team, Ashley Brown, Ken Miles, and Luke Severe. And we asked them, hey, can you commit to giving $100 a month just, just to have something in the bank account uh, for a year, for a year? Um, and they, they agreed to that. Then we had a couple of other folks. We invited them to be, to be a part of uh, the, the launch team. They said, listen, I can't be a part of the launch team. I can't do all the things you want me to do. Uh, I don't have the time for it, but I'd like to be a financial partner, right? And so then about two or three folks decided, you know what, I'll, gi- I'll give I'll a give thousand uh, for the year and I'll break it up, right? Um, and I'm here to tell you that all those folks who said that honored that, right? They mi- it might have been a lump sum at the end of the year. It might have been 100 every month, but they all honored that, right? And so, and so with our pooling together of resources, we had a few thousand dollars to do a little something. Now, how many of y'all live in Brooklyn? Just, just by, show of, by show of emoticons and hands, okay? Um, y'all know what, what rent feels like in Brooklyn, right? Okay, so we were really grateful for, for the ways in which the people had pulled our resources, but we were like, Lord, uh, what, what are we going to do with this $3,000 uh, for a launch of a whole church? What, what, how are we going to make it happen, Lord? Let me tell y'all something. I just need to testify because it's only God, right? We ended up doing our preview year for a year um, in a coffee shop, a dope coffee shop called Brooklyn Commons, right? Um, This thing was on Atlantic Avenue, right off the Brooklyn Bridge, blocks away from the Barclays Center, like prime real estate. And the baristas were actually baristering, okay? I made up that word, I made up that word. But they were actually like still like serving coffee and tea and snacks and things. And and then the place had, the place had, uh, uh, what's it called, live stream. They had a camera already in the place in the background. They had a little baby stage. It wasn't this high, but it was higher than the ground. Um, And they had some chairs and they had some Wi-Fi. And we walked in there with a cold, just kind of, Pastor Andrew, we just walked in. We didn't really uh, know anybody, but we were like, oh, this place is kind of cool. Do y'all do events? They said, oh, actually, uh, the, the owner of the place is upstairs. Let's, let's get her. 
right? I'm just, I'm just telling y'all my story. That's why I said it's long, but it's necessary. Because um, not everybody knows this story, so we're going we're gonna to start from what God has already done, then we're going to go to what God can do. If you're wondering why I'm walking you through it, we're going to start with what God has already done, then we're going to get to what God can do. Amen. And so, and so, you know, so we just wandered in, just wandered in, and just happened to be that the owner was there on a Sunday afternoon. Y'all, that's random. That doesn't often happen, but, but God, right? So this woman comes down. Her name is Melissa. She comes down, and she says, hi, I heard you were trying to, trying to rent the space. Yes, we're trying to rent the space. Um, we're at church. We weren't a church yet. We, we, were, we were a dream at that point. But we said, we're at church. We're at church, and <laughs> we got, we're looking for a place to meet. We're looking for a place to meet. She said, okay. She said, well, well what are your dates? Right? I looked at Pastor Andrew and said, what are our dates? And we looked at our phones. We said, well, our dates are... It was August. I said, I said, I said October, October, October 2018. That's when we want to launch. <laughs> Made it up right there in the spot. She said, she said, okay. She said, and how many dates would you like? I'm like, ma'am, you asking a lot of questions. You asking a lot of questions, ma'am. I was like, okay. I said, I said, how, she said, how many, how many dates would you like? We looked at each other. Now, y'all know by this point, this 2018, so Pastor Andrew and I have been married eight years together. 13, 14, something like that. So we had that kind of like, we could talk with our eyes, but we didn't say nothing. So, so she said, how many dates do you want? So we looked at each other real quick. I said, I said four. We'd like four. We'd like four. Pulled it out of the sky, y'all. Just, just pulled it out of the sky. We'd like four dates, please. Okay. And, and how frequently? Here goes Pastor Andrew. Um, we're thinking quarterly. I was like, you better use that quarterly word because that makes sense to people, right? Quarterly makes sense. He's like, we're thinking quarterly. So, okay. She said, let me get my book. She went upstairs to get her book because she old school. It's not in her phone. It's in her book. She went upstairs to get her book. As she went upstairs to get her book, I was like, Drew, how much you think this place is? Because uh, I think she thinks we got money. He was like, well, let's just see. Let's just see. Let's just see. Here's how God works. He happened to have his book on him that he had just released earlier that year. Shout out to published authors who have their merch on them. So he, he just happened to have his book on him because Pastor Andrew always got a book on him. Y'all know that. And so, and so he has his book on him. That's, that's going to be relevant in about two seconds. So she comes back down. I'm, I'm saying, I'm like, Drew, we, I don't, this looks like an expensive place. Like they got, they got, you know, stages and lights and, you know, baristas, baristaing and all of the nine, right? I don't know, but we just going to act like we're supposed to be here because, you know, every now and again, you got to, you got to show up in your future and your present. You just got to be like, I, I'm supposed to be here. Amen. Okay. So she comes back down with the book. She says, okay. She says, I actually have availability October 18, 2018. I said, great. We'll take it. And then she said, okay, quarterly. She said, okay, so, so that would make the next date January. Yes. And we were like, yeah. And she was like, what date would you like? <laughs> um, so we're like, okay. And so I'm like, well, Pastor Andrew stays booked and busy on MLK weekend. So in my head, I'm like, we may as well get some of that energy for double love. So we were like, MLK weekend would be the next date. Thank you. And she was like, okay, great. And she's like, okay, now what's the next date? That's going to be about April. I said, April, that's going to be Easter. I said, we'll take Easter Sunday. And I just stayed, I started Googling. I promise y'all. Started promise. I, I started Googling and I was like, we'll take Easter Sunday. She said, okay. And then that last late, that last date will land you in, in about the summer. Summer, right? Which, which date would you like? So we were like, three months from Easter, we'll take it, right? Which ended up being July. Okay, great. So here she goes. So she now has four dates, beloved. She got four dates in her calendar. She, you know, and, and um, at this point, I'm like, money's, money's coming. She about to ask us what our budget is and we ain't got one so you know so so I'm listening I'm, I'm, I'm we, we really are like in the conversation right and so at this point she says to us she says she says um now I'm gonna have to charge you enough to cover my baristas when I tell y'all my heart sank my heart was like oh lord okay this, this is gonna be steep because we got to cover the baristas and the space. Okay, Jesus. So here I go. You know, my good PR voice. I used to do PR, so I can, I can do crisis management. It seemed like everything's okay when the world's falling apart. So I was like, okay, well, not a problem. Not a problem. Uh, what, what, what should we anticipate budgeting for the baristas? So that was my question. That was good, right? That was my question. She said, oh, you know, we can, we can take care of them for about $100. I said, okay, that sounds great. That sounds wonderful, right? In my head, I'm shouting like Chelsea in production. I'm just, I was shouting. Y'all can't see Chelsea, but she's shouting right now. In my head, I was shouting, and me and Drew, like Pastor Drew and I, we had kind of like a little like hand connection, like, 
work, or, you know, but you got to keep your game face on. You can't be, can't be too excited when people give you numbers that are good because you don't want them to change the numbers, right? So we said, okay, you know, that would be wonderful. And so here I took a deep breath and I said, so what would that bring our total to uh, per, per, per month? <clears throat> she said, oh, you're a church, right? Yes, we're a church. That could be good or bad in New York, y'all. That could be... <laughs> <laughs> okay, that could be good or bad, because I'm telling you, it's just a straight-up coffee shop. This is not a faith-based anything. She says, she says, you're a church, right? She says, well, I really don't think it's right to charge churches. The woman is not a Christian. And so I said, oh, that's, that's so kind. So here go Drew, Pastor Drew, he ready to close the deal now. He like, I done heard enough. So he's like, he's like, okay, so would that mean that we only need to cover the baristas? In my head, I'm like, just a hundred dollars, but I'm, I'm not gonna say that because you know. So Pastor Andrew's like, so does that mean we only need to cover the baristas? She said, sure, just cover the baristas. We have our dates. The space is yours. When I tell you we shouted, we ain't even Pentecostal, but Malik, we put up and put them down on that day. We said, and so we looked at her little book. And we saw that our names were written, right, in the last book of life. We were written in Melissa's date book, the owner of the space, not the manager, but the owner of the space. And that was the day that Double Love was born. That was the day. Once we had a location, once we had dates, we said, oh, it's on and popping because we know one thing about the wills. We know how to have church and plan some events. That ain't what we needed was a location. We needed a budget and we needed a partner. This woman, who did not profess to be a woman of faith, decided that she wanted to be partners with us. And then after we closed the deal, that's when she noticed Pastor Andrew's book. And she said, wait, isn't that your name? <laughs> and he was like, oh, yeah, yeah, this is my book. Tell me why, y'all. This woman, so Pastor Andrew has a book. It's called Freedom Notes. It's a dope book. Y'all should get it. It came out in 2018. But the thing that's the flex is that um, on the front of the book is an endorsement from Cornell West. And the endorsement is like, Andrew's one of the most brilliant minds of our time or something like that. Um, so, so it's that. And it's Freedom Notes, Reflections on Faith, Justice, and the Possibility of Democracy, right? So here's where it gets interesting. We've already closed the deal. I'm trying to leave so she doesn't change her mind. But she sees his book, and she's like, wait, isn't that your name? He's like, oh, yeah, you know, I just finished the book, blah, 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 blah. You know, he gives her a copy, signs it, whatever. This woman goes on to then say that she did her dissertation at Yale, which I had just graduated from like months prior, um, in political science, which is the PhD that Pastor Andrew's degree is in right now. And she was talking about like economic justice and all the things that Pastor Andrew like loves to talk about. And she was like, but you know what? I didn't graduate, I protested because whatever happened. So she finished her degree, but she wouldn't walk. So we were like, oh, you down, right? And, it, and this woman is like, you know, an older woman, you know, you wouldn't really know exactly what her background is. And so once we had that connection, it was like the Holy Spirit not only gave us a, a business partner, but then it was like she understood the mission of what we were up to. Right. So we got not only an economic partner, which we couldn't imagine, we got a, a, a real estate partner, which we couldn't imagine. But then we got a missional partner. Somebody who was like, I'm not a Christian, I'm not a woman of faith, but I rock with that. I rock with that faith, justice, and the possibility of democracy. Then she's like, tell me more about your church. From that point on, we had no issues with Melissa. Not that we ever had issues, but she became more than just um, um, a landowner giving us space. She became a partner. Right, right. This is how we originally funded the dream. And so then the money that the launch team had pledged to give that 100 a month plus the two or three folks who decided to give that 1,000 in one year, which is basically the same amount of money the launch team had pledged to give 1,200 a year, those folks said they give 1,000 a year. Uh, we were able to use that money to then hire musicians, to then hire photography, videography, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, then, and then, you know, we basically, of course, we had to dip into our resources, every entrepreneur does, but, but here's what's the blessing, when we got there, our first First worship service we had I believe I want to say 85 or so people in the space we had over 400 people on the live stream and it wasn't Facebook where you just happen upon it it was live stream where you had to literally go to that link you don't just happen upon live stream and we said wait a minute this is a thing this is a thing with the people right why do I tell you that story 
I tell you that story because this has never been a church that has functioned off of a great degree of wealth, but it has always been a, fun a church that has functioned off of a great degree of relationality, of commonality, of pursuit of the common good, of, y'all know I love to say this, little becomes much in the master's hand. And so people could not fathom how we were in that location, so they just assumed that we had been sent by some other congregation, that we had been seated by some other place, because how was it possible that we were in a location like that with those kinds of, um, we are, you know, immediate live stream, this signage we got just before that service, this sign's been with us as long as the church has been open, um, and things of that nature, but we were able to do what we needed to do based on the relationship with somebody who wasn't even a Christian but who saw the vision, but really, I believe, who God designed to be someone who would partner with us to bring this church to life, right? That's how we started. So we spent that year in the preview year, and the year was wonderful, and, you know, people came, and they said they enjoyed it. Then we did several uh, small group dinners. Uh, people said they enjoyed that. And then it was time to find another location because management changed at the end of our preview year. We could have never anticipated that. But the owner decided she wanted to go back home, take care of her mother, and so she brought somebody else on. And that person did not want to have a church every week. They were cool with quarterly, but they weren't cool with every week. So we had to then go and try to figure out where we could be, blah, blah, blah. We ended up in this theater off of a Google search, right? No relationship, just Google search. Came in here, saw what they had, we saw what was possible, we were able to lock in with them. Had our first worship service November 2019. Four months later, the pandemic begins, right? So, so when we got here, we didn't really have a lot of reserve in the bank at that point either. It, 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 you know, the money that had come in had allowed us to do church the way we wanted to do church, but there wasn't a whole lot of you know, resources stored away. So we got here. And because this place is owned by a church, uh, they charge far less than most places would charge for an equal kind of space. But it was still something that stretched us, right? It was still something that we, we didn't really have. But then the people, y'all, began to start giving, right? Y'all began to give in offering. Y'all began to give in tithes. Um, and then uh, the, the, the village, right? That's what I like to call it, the village of people who were not double love folks but who understood the work of the church. They began to, to email us and say, you know, you were on my heart. I just want to, I can't do much, but here's, here's $200. You were on my heart. I, I can't do much, but I want to give to double love. Here, I, I want you to do this. I want you to do that. All of a sudden, different individuals began to open up their own resources and, and send stuff double love's way. And there were so many times that, that it was in that same moment that somebody sent $300, $500 that we were that much short for uh, the lease rent that week or that much short to pay the band or that much short to do what we needed to do or we had reached into our pockets already and God basically put back in what we had taken out of our own household. And I began to watch God. I was like, God, this is crazy. Like, this is really wild. Like, we, we are in New York City. We're in New York City doing church in New York City with no seed funding, no, no safety net, none of that, just out of the generosity of the people. And then four months into us being in here, the pandemic begins. Pandemic begins March 2020. I'm going somewhere, I promise. We're going to still get out on time. March 2020, pandemic begins. We spend 12 weeks, three months, where we do not enter this theater at all. We literally took the signage, turned our living room and our home into our pulpit, and the production team found this program which allowed them to basically produce from their homes the worship service, and we went live from our pulpit for 12 weeks. We had to furlough the music ministry. We went into our archives of music from the preview year and from the three months that we had had before, the, before uh, service and just reran music and then would cut into live videos for 12 weeks. And giving was basically non-existent because everybody was trying to figure out the pandemic. It was like, all right, furlough the band, 
see how long we can do that. We're gonna do everything from home, try to see if that means that the theater will allow us not to pay because we're not using the space. Had to deal with our, for our Bible study location, Class and Code. We went from having the largest space in Class and Code to having whatever, what's the small, y'all know, we were like, what's the smallest amount that we can pay to not get kicked out of this thing? Because we like y'all, we like y'all a lot. We just, we just got to be frugal, we got to be frugal. And we began to kind of move some things around, and, and all of a sudden, right about like the Lenten season, in the pandemic, while we were still uh, broadcasting from home, while we were still furloughing the band, what we did was, even though the band was furloughed, every week we would still get on Zoom with them and have Bible study. Every week we would still have testimonies. Every week we would still pray with them. Even though they were not rendering service, we were not able to pay with them, we still were in relationships, spiritual relationship together as a church. Then we'd go into the virtual Zoom control room that we created for Double Love, and, and we'd go in there, and they'd be in my AirPod telling me, you know, when to preach and when to stop and, and when the music's coming in and when it's not. You, you couldn't tell me we were in DLE broadcast station coming to you live from Brooklyn, New York, Bedford Stuyvesant to be exact. I mean, we, we had that thing down right and then and then it was time to, to, to step out on faith and reopen and so we reopened uh, not to the congregation but we reopened in here in June 2020 June 2020 that matters stay with me talking about what God has done so what God's gonna do that matters because when we decided to come back in here the bills decided to come back in here yeah, where are my grown folks at? We, we, when we decided to bring the band back and to be back in the theater and all that stuff, y'all were at home, but since we were back here, the bills were back here, right? The, the costs were back here. But we knew it was important to uh, reclaim the physical space of the church, right, in some capacity, and so we did. And again, we, we started sending out emails to, to our comrades in the struggle, other ministers, other churches. Like, hey, y'all, uh, Double Love's still out here, but y'all know we a baby church, right? Uh, we struggling. Can, can anybody help us? It's a smoke signal. <laughs> can anybody? Is there anybody? <laughs> you just, just, you know, you just got to be, every now and again, you got to ask for what you need. Right? Ask, <laughs> knock, and the door shall be open, right? Seek, and you shall find. And so we began to just email our colleagues. And it was very bold because everybody was going through a pandemic. We weren't the only ones. But we began to email our colleagues, and do you know that pastors who had their own uh, responsible responsibilities financially, they began to say, well, I can't do a whole lot, but here you go. And, and I can't do this every month, but I can do this this week. And people began to send resources to us, and that allowed us to keep up with the cost of doing church in the middle of a pandemic as a brand new church. Fast forward to 2021, DLE outside. We outside. That's right about the time Evelyn came around. She kept telling me, we outside, Pastor Gabby. We outside. DLE outside, another, another moment where we had our team meetings. I was like, all right, production, I want us to be outside somewhere nice. They were like, Pastor Gabby, what's the budget? We ain't got one. But I want to be outside somewhere really nice. Can, can y'all work your connections? <laughs> and we, we all in these production call meetings, and they like, oh, I found this place. Like, yeah, we can't afford that. But, but somewhere nice, though, because, you know, we got standards. We don't have money, but we got standards, okay? We got, we got standards. So, we, you know, we look at And once again, y'all, I promise you, once again, Pastor Andrew and I were at brunch in bed happened to walk by a garden, and this man was like, uh, you know, tending to the garden and whatnot. And um, it was a black man. So we looked and we were like, oh, this is a nice place. Here I go. Do you do events? <laughs> um, yeah, we do events. So, you know, what, 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 are you, what are you asking about? You know, 15 minutes into the conversation, the man was like, oh, sure, y'all can come here. What? Really? Y'all can come here, no problem. Okay, great. How, how, how much? This question. How much? Oh, you know what? You all can just give me a donation. Whatever it is you're able to afford is fine by me. Daryl Montgomery Hill, Hancock Community Garden. Okay. I was like, all right. He said, the only thing. The black breast and breathing, that's his mantra. That's his mantra, Malik. You got it right. How you doing, Daryl? Black breast and breathing. Listen. Uh, but he said, my one thing is, y'all can't make too much noise. I was like, oh, Lord. Oh, Lord, they're going to kick us out. Because one thing about DLE, 
One thing about Dion Lee, we, you know, we, we get a little excited and we have some noise. He was like, one thing, only thing is y'all can't make too much noise and you can't bring a drum set. Now, I, I, y'all know I be doing my anthems and my mantras. I really, I really need the drums. <laughs> it's like, but wisdom said, wisdom said, okay, we'll work it out. We'll work it out. Told the team. They were like, no drums. What you mean? No drums. <laughs> they were like, what? Wait, what? And I kid you not, this brother right here on the sound engineer board, Taz got on the phone and started talking his talk. And all I know is we got approval for an electronic drum set. We'll say, we'll take it. And we, we had our first worship experience since the pandemic, 18 months before we had been together physically. We went outside, transformed that garden into a sanctuary. The people came from off the streets. We were in Prospect Park the day before by invitation and partnership with the Juneteenth organization. And somehow Chase and Sam had a sound in like the Village Underground in there. Like it was like, like a thing and I was just like how and they had like a little like swag and then like Malik and CJ and Simone and them got up and they were like swaying a little bit different and I was like wait wait a minute this is another this is another version of double love but I like this too and we were able to do what we need to do and because he said by donation only we were able to figure out that cost and then y'all know you can't do anything outside without additional equipment, additional sound. And so Taz said, you know what, don't worry about it. I work with a lot of people and I think that I can get these numbers down for us so we can do what we need to do and not break the budget. Y'all don't know when to shout. And so Taz went into his bag and got his people and did his thing. And then Malik was like, don't worry about it, Pastor Gabby. We're going to change the songs up a little bit so it won't be what we normally do on a Sunday, but it's going to be what we can do to make it, give it a little DLE vibe. Don't worry about it. I said, okay, Malik, I trust you because you know I need a little bounce. He was like, I got you, no problem. And look, in production, they had all the things. They had tripods and cameras and, and iPads. And what. And Ashley was like, don't worry about it. I got iPad Pro. We're going to make this work. And I'm going to sit right here. And, and all I know is I looked up and we had a bomb set up for DLE outside. And it was our return. Somebody say return. It was our return of of physical worship, once again, all these people stewarding and funding the dream. The dream was, we got to come back together safely, but we've got to come back together. The dream was, we got to reach people that we don't know yet, because we're still a new church, and the only way we're going to reach them is to go where they are. Somebody say engaging the curious. The dream was, we've got to get out there and figure out, are there still individuals that are responding to what we're doing as a church? And the answer was a resounding yes. And I'm here to tell you that from DLE outside until right now, people have been giving double and triple what they ever gave. From DLE outside until now our resources have abundantly changed from DLE outside till now which means from June 2021 till now we have not had to worry about not being able to pay for what we got to pay for have I got a witness from June 2021 till now we have been able to fund the dream from June 2021 till now we have been able to be creative and guess what throughout all that time we were we're still able to give to other organizations all throughout that time we gave to different places like transparent and black and Haitian black alliance and national bailout and middle church and even though we had a little bit we gave what we could black millennial cafe and all these places and I'm here to tell you that we are here on faith and relationship and we've been able to fund the dream with little With little. And so, beloved, here's the pivot. God has done so much for us. And we've done this without 100% tithing. We've done this. So imagine. I hear you, Evelyn. We've done this with people sporadically feeling prompted by the Holy Spirit to give and a handful of folks being committed to tithing. That's what we've done. And we're so grateful. But I just believe we are in a season where we've got to dream even bigger. It was a bold and audacious dream to believe that we could start a church in the heart of Brooklyn, New York without any seed funding. 
It was a bold and audacious dream to believe that we could be in the heart of bed outside, have an outdoor church without any funding. And it is now time for us to fund the dream even differently because in this time period, we might be a small church, but our church has bonded in new ways. We have been able to go through highs and lows together. We've been able to celebrate accomplishments and to mourn when we mourn and to rejoice when we rejoice. We have done so much together as a church, and now it's time to take hold of dream number four to become a 100% tithing church because we have more work to do. We have bigger dreams to accomplish. So the scripture for today is one of those scriptures that I think is so powerful because it talks about the power of the village talks about the power of communal living. It talks about what is possible when everybody does what is within their reach, right? That's what tithing is. Tithing does not require that everybody gives the same amount. Hear me. Somebody tells you that's what tithing is, they're lying to you. Tithing is 10% of your income. 10% of what you have, which means equal giving in the house of God will never mean equal numbers. Somebody type that for me in the comments. Equal giving will never mean equal numbers, but equal giving will always mean equal sacrifice. Okay, I'm say that again. Equal giving will never mean equal numbers. But equal giving will always mean equal sacrifice. Because 10% is 10% is 10%. Whatever is in your bank account, that's not my business. But we are equally sacrificing 10% of what God has given us and giving it back to the Lord. And guess what? That's really the starting point. We're supposed to do tithes and offering. But I'm just dealing with tithes right now. 10% is never going to be the same amount as your neighbor. But don't worry about what your neighbor is giving. Worry about whether or not you and your neighbor are equally covenanting to sacrifice. Right? Think about our story. Imagine if Melissa from Brooklyn Commons had decided, I normally don't charge churches, but I'm going to charge them. Imagine if Daryl had said, I normally don't charge organizations, but I'm going to charge them. Imagine if people who had it in their capacity to exploit us had done so. We would not be here. But it's out of the generosity and the kindness of individuals who said, I'm going to do my part because I believe in what's going forth. I believe in what they're up to over there that we have been able to be who we are as a church community. And so in Acts chapter 4, verse 36, we see this man named Barnabas who is a landowner who sells his field and brings the resources to the apostles for the apostles to divvy it up. But then in the next verse, chapter 5, verse 1, we see a couple who does the same thing, who sells their land. But the Bible says this couple talks amongst themselves and says, we're going to keep this for ourselves and just bring this portion to the church. The couple goes before the apostles individually. But they receive the same uh, consequences for their action because they had made the same agreement in their hearts in their home. Be careful who you agree with, even if it's your family. Be careful with letting anybody persuade you that God is not due what God is due. Because not only will they be judged, but you're going to be judged too, right? But when we have the principle like Barnabas does of bringing what it is we have to the Lord and letting God sort it out from there, signs and wonders, miracles and blessings are able to occur. And so this dream that we have for double love as we go forward is three things that I want us to guard against. Is that all right? The three things that I want us to guard against as a church community, I want you to be mindful of these three things. Somebody type it in the comments for me. Be mindful of deception. 
Be mindful of greed. Be mindful of indifference. Be mindful of deception. Deception says, I want somebody to believe something about me that is not true. Because if they believe the lie, it's better for me. Be mindful of deception. Ananias and Sapphira were engaged in an act of deception. They came into the church as though they were giving equal sacrifices, but they were really deceiving because they had intentionally withheld what they were really supposed to bring. I believe the sin wasn't even necessarily in what they gave or didn't give. The sin was in the deception. The sin was in the premeditated intent to deceive. It's one thing for you to say, Pastor Gabby, I just, I'm not ready to tithe yet. God's still working on me. Okay, you're being honest. I'm going to pray that God um, helps to illuminate for you the benefits, but at least you're being honest. But if you say to me, Pastor Gabby, I'm going, I'm going to tithe. I'm, I'm so excited. I'm going to tithe. And then you tithe and off of, I don't know, you, something that you know is not the thing you're supposed to be tithing off of, right? That's, that's intentional deception. I want them to believe that I'm, that, I'm, that I'm opting in in a particular way, but actually I'm not, right? Honesty is going to always get you further than anything else. We'd rather you be honest and say, I'm not there yet. But, you know, when I get there, uh, praise God. If I don't get there, you know, I'll be all right. But, but honesty is always, 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 always going to get you as far as you need to go. Thank you, Chelsea. Greed. We want to guard against greed, right? If the people I narrated in our story today, in the story of double love, had been greedy, they really could have double, triple, quadrupled what they asked of us. They really could have. And we wouldn't have been able to say anything but thank you, but, you know, unfortunately we can't, we can't do that. But, but because they were not greedy, they got what they needed to attend to their needs. They weren't selfless to the point where they didn't have what they needed. But they weren't greedy. And if we can get to a place in funding the dream where we are not greedy as individuals, but where we're like, you know what? I, I want to help, right? I want to help in the way that I can. We can get a whole lot farther. And then thirdly, indifference. Indifference is a callousness. You know, it makes me know never mind. It is what it is. I hope they get what they need. But... Indifference can be like a cancer spreading through an enthusiastic community. Because your indifference can rub off on someone who's excited. If you're not excited yet, if this dream isn't speaking to you yet, that's okay. But don't bring your indifference to the space where people who are excited about resolve People who are excited about next level things. People who are excited about funding the dream. Don't let your indifference spread like a cancer throughout that community. I also believe that one of the reasons why Ananias and Sapphira end up receiving the consequence of death for their actions is because can you imagine how they would have been talking smack if they got away with it? Like Barnabas, yo. You bugging. I went in there. I was like, so this is what I have. This is what I'm bringing. And they didn't even know the difference. Can you imagine how they would have been just cocky, arrogant, trying to get everybody else to cut corners? And can you imagine the number of needs that would have gone unmet that could have been met if people had not been giving in to the indifference and the deception and the greed of this couple? So as we're in this year and a half of trying to fund the dream, I need us to be on guard for individuals who are practicing deception, greed, or indifference. Here's what it looks like. If you're around somebody that you can tell one of those three things is coming up for them, you know, just, just lovingly say to them, you know what, There's, we have six dreams. It's going to sound shady, but I, I, I'm serious. We have six dreams. You know, what other dream excites you? Translation, this ain't your dream. 
So don't be a dream killer for folks whom it is. Okay? We got six dreams. You like youth? Go, go, go to dream number five team. We, we, we could use you with the youth. You, you like Bible study? You like study? Go. Like, we have other things that you can do until this dream excites you. But don't you dare bring your deception, greed, or indifference to this group of people who have covenanted to equal sacrifice. Because we have work before us that God has called us to. And we need every person who is activated to remain activated and to activate others. Right? So as we move through this, uh, and I'm closing because I'm, I'm really, I'm really at, at, at the ending point, but I wanted to make sure that y'all knew the story because you, 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 you can't clearly know where we're going if you don't know where we came from, right? Um, but but I, I, I want us to be on guard of those three things. I'm going to leave you with these quotes and then I'm, I'm going to uh, get out of your way. And on Tuesday night, we're going to talk about how we really make this happen. Henry Nowen is a theologian. He says, asking people for money is giving them the opportunity to put their resources at the disposal of advancing the reign of God. Who among us does not want to be a part of the agenda of advancing the reign of God? Maya Angelou puts it like this. She says, I have found that among its other benefits, giving liberates the soul of the giver. It is better to give than it is to receive. Another Henry Nowen quote that I like, every time we approach folks to give, we're inviting them into the vision of fruitfulness. We're giving them a way to take part. Vision casting is a way of proclaiming what we believe in such a way that we offer other people an opportunity to participate with us in our vision and our mission. The, the six dreams that we have for this church cannot be animated if this dream is not put into effect. We have to fund the dream. We can't engage the curious without funding. We can't do Bible study appropriately without funding. We can't reach the Brooklyn youth without funding. We cannot do economic empowerment accurately and well without funding. We need this dream activated. And I'm going to be completely transparent with you all. In all the time that Double Love has been open, Pastor Andrew and I have never taken a salary. But we're in the year now where we need to be able to take a salary so we can keep doing what we need to do for this church. We have dreams of not only employing us, we want to be able to get some of our contract workers off of contracts and into actual full time with benefits and, and, and the whole nine that happens when you work at a place where you're staff and not a contract employee. We need to be able to fund the, the giving that we've done just scratches the surface. We want to give to far more other organizations. We have things that we want to do. And we can do it before we even get to any outside funding. We can do it if we have 100% tithing, right? I want to give you one more thing, and then I'm closing. We're going to end church at 630, all right? I'm a, Evelyn, I'm going to do the invitation so I can do it quickly. But we're going to end at 630, amen? Old Testament theologian Walter Brueggemann says it like this. Money and possessions belong to God and are held in trust by human persons and community. These resources do not belong to us. We are stewards. All those who hold possessions in trust are accountable for their use and management. This dream is not only a dream to have folks give, but it's a dream to have folks who feel called to financial literacy to begin to volunteer and to create a team. One of the things that Luke was doing before he passed was helping us get our stewardship in place. We had designated him our minister of stewardship. And we were beginning to have conversations with folks who wanted to give to Double Love and trying to figure out how to set systems in place so that Pastor Andrew and I could take salary. And while he is no longer here, I believe there are some other individuals in our midst, who feel called to this work, 
who say, you know what, Pastor Gabby, I'm a tie, that ain't no problem, but I, I have some ideas. I have a financial background. I'm an accountant. I have an MBA. I work in finance. Every dream is going to have a team around it to make sure these dreams come to pass. This dream is no different. Churches have trustees. CFOs, we're at that point at Double Love where we need some folks saying, I will be a steward over the resources. Where are you? Where are the individuals for whom this is not only an act of obedience, but is a response to a call on your life? Some of y'all are called to this. It ain't my gift, it ain't my ministry. God has blessed us abundantly, but we need some help. Not only with the giving. Oh, did I tell y'all we're 501c3 certified? Yeah, yeah. We did that last year. That came in last summer. So we working. We're doing our part. What does that mean? That means everybody giving these large gifts, y'all can write them off. Amen, somebody. But we need your help. We need your help. Help us fund the dream. 